Good evening, everyone. Um, I have to say, I, I'm really chuffed to be here. This is the first time I've ever presented at a UXP event, uh, UXPA event. And so I'm really pleased to be here. Um, a lot of people, um, if there's a guy here who once called me a sleazy marketer, I just want to set your mind at rest. Uh, I'm really well known for doing A-B testing, um, but what a lot of people don't actually know is I've been doing UX work since 1999. Um, there's all sorts of boring stuff on here. Probably the most important thing is please tweet me on Optimizer Time now or after if you have any questions. Um, so I was going to talk you through the timeline of my career, but more important is to talk you through the timeline of my troughs of disillusionment, right? <laughs> and I've been through multiple ones of these, and I thought, I'll show you a couple of them, because there are multiple overlapping ones. But the UX hype cycle, back when I first discovered it, I was like, yes, this is going to change the world, right? And I was like, I'm going to fix everything. I'm even going to go and become totally obsessed with the UX of everything. Parking machines, everything, ticket machines. I want to fix them all. You're all rubbish, you need to sort it out. And I actually spent five hours watching people interacting with this parking machine. And if you want to know what's so fucking evil about it, you can ask me later. I actually went and observed it on a bench and I wrote to the people that make this and I was like, you're doing a really horrible thing here, this is really evil and you need to fix it. Didn't care, they were like, go away, we're not interested. <laughs> this is really, really evil. If you ever see one of these, watch it and you'll see what I'm talking about. But I became totally obsessed about fixing everything, even though the rest of the world hadn't exactly followed me to that place. I then sank into the trough of disillusionment. This was when it was love film. I was asked to make a campaign to save the planet, to save the trees, save paper, by sending two of your DVDs back in one envelope. Except we never sent you any less envelopes if you did that, right? <laughs> okay, so, you know, cynically trying to get one over on the British public when they're not actually that dumb was a big mistake. And I vowed at that point, I will never, ever do another lying, cheating campaign like that. And I told the CEO of the firm, Love Film, um, that this was a terrible thing to do. And he was hell-bent on doing these evil things to customers. That sent me and him on loggerheads. And I got made redundant five days before my shares vested. Coincidence? Two million quid's worth of coincidence. I still think about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> So, sadly, it's money, it's gone. But then I actually started to break the bonds of kind of the UX roles that I'd been taught and grew up with. You know, these kind of nice little compartmentalized units of UX people that get sold. And it's still true today. You know, we're still selling the same kind of units of people in UX agencies. And we, we didn't really break outside of the bonds of these silos and these roles. And that's when I learned to actually break out of my team and get outside the silos. And that's another story, if you want to know. But that really helped me to understand about getting the mix right, the balance between what the business wanted, the customer wanted, and sorting out these often conflicting things. You know, So getting out of that silo was the best thing that I ever did. And the A-B test type cycle, same thing. I discovered A-B test is great. I'll go and test all sorts of stupid things. Then I realized that basically most of the tests that I and everyone else have been doing are total bullshit. And then I actually worked out the maths and how to prioritize the work that I'm doing. So I'm not just doing random testing, I'm testing in places where I know there is a problem and I can actually shift user behavior. And that's kind of led me to be a bit of a plumber now. I can actually look at people's flows in their website, both flow of delight and money, and I can shape them, I can make things happen. It's a, it's a kind of form of plumbing consultant more than anything else. But I, I was in a nice corporate company job and decided last year to go back and do some hands-on work and freelance, and, and it was absolutely batshit. You know, I'd completely forgotten what it was like as someone going into a company and not having any authority or any influence and trying to get them to do things. And this used to be the way I felt sometimes. And, you know, how was your day? You know, it was, it was, uh, it was mental. This is the marketing team. Hello. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but I did get to work for cool people like these. Uh, but this is my cynical quadrant. Basically, if you improve the UX and there's no revenue, they'll fire you, right? And, uh, you know, if, uh, if you improve the revenue but not the UX, they'll fire you, right? And uh, if you don't do either, they'll fire you, right? And there's only one place to be here, right? And it's really hard to get there. 
Um, so I, I've learnt this through bitter, uh, cynical uh, experience. So I'm going to do a quick round uh, of some tools and tips today, and I'm not going to preach to converted here at this point, but this is really important to tell your clients and the people you work with. Get them out of the office. Stop talking to your colleagues about these problems. They don't know either. Um, and it's, it's really important not... Uh, and. Uh, I don't want to dwell on lab testing, but the thing that's wrong with this picture is this guy's an actor. He's a stand-in to make the room look more busy because no one's fucking there. They're all back at your corporate office and they didn't come to watch a usability test. So one interesting way of solving that problem, you really need not one person turning up, you need 30 or 40 in your company to see. Remote testing, really great. We did work with Foolproof. Uh, they're here today. They can talk to you about this. But they had a moderator who sat in London. Um, we then controlled the participant who could be anywhere around the world. And then we have all these viewers who can dial in at any time or anywhere, watch half a session an hour. They don't have to come to the office. So how many people would turn up for these, right? Well, a lot more than one, usually 15 or 20 people. So now I've massively increased my audience by 15,000% or whatever it is. Um, and I get more people interested in looking at my data and results and, uh, you know, the empathy level increases. So it's a good little tip. You also have traffic coming to your site. If you or the people you work with have traffic, you can use these tools to recruit people, either from panel-based services, user testing are here tonight. That's one that I, I've used a lot. Just be really careful. If you're UX guys here, you know that if you get biased samples, you've got a problem. So I was doing a, a test of one of these videos once and I was watching the guy and the guy said, well, this looks really interesting, this book. I, I might buy that one because I'm doing an HCI course at the moment. And I was like, if there's one person I do not want doing a usability test on my site, it's a guy on an HCI course, right? So far too opinionated. So please use these, but be aware of the limitations of them, but use these rather than nothing. Nothing is not a good choice. Um, but now people have their devices, and we used to have them at home, and if you wanted to visit them where they were using them in that context, you had to go to their home. But now people have their devices out at pubs and coffee bars. So I was working with a couple of people in Brighton recently, and, and they, they have a lot of people in the target market who like drinking, who are students, and who hang out and places that they can get to easily from their office. So taking them out to show people prototypes and getting usability feedback for the price of a beer or a coffee is really, really cheap UX research. But you've got to know how to interview and you also got to know what some tools to use. Um, some of you will be familiar with these, um, but if you're not, please go and have a look at them. This, this is quite interesting. It allows you to record mobile browsing sessions so you can take this stuff out and use it. And Reflection and Reflector allow you to mirror something so you can, you can sit someone on a sofa with a tablet and they can sit there naturally using it. They don't have to have it sat in a camera right where it's all kind of a bit stilted. And then you could be monitoring in the other room on another iOS machine a complete mirror of that screen and then record it from there. So these are really neat tools if you want to do guerrilla testing on a budget. Um, another thing, the Secret Millionaire. Um, Tesco used to make IT developers that made products go and use them in the store. So if you made a system for the deli counter, you had to go every month and listen to people bitching and whining about the system that you <laughs> built as you were volunteering. That's a great way of creating a feedback loop. And one of the biggest motivational strategies I have with teams and developers is to get them connected with what's happening with their work. Normally, Bob, the developer, does some work. Nobody tells them anything. It goes in sight. He never hears. He goes home demoralized and depressed every week because no one's connected the stuff that he did with what happened to customers or revenue. And so if you're connecting your team with the pain points and the outcomes of their work, then you're actually getting that level of empathy up. And... It, you know, if you're going to go and interview people, whether, uh, you know, it's just a little bit of sort of inspection or whether you're going to do full-blown us usability interviews, I thought that this would be easy. You just go and, like, ask them questions and stuff, and they'll tell you the truth. No. You really need to know how to interview. And these are my best interviewing tips. Please read them. If you're going to do any research with people, you need to know how to ask the right questions. But the basic advice is shut the fuck up, listen some more, shut the fuck up some more, listen some more, ask good questions, and repeat. 
that is the strategy for interviewing. Mm. The other thing is, most people never immerse themselves in the product, so marketing directors have never seen what their campaign looks like when you go to Google and search and come to the landing page. Why not? If you're in a department store, the department store manager wants to know when the new stuff is out in the store. He wants to walk it and see it and feel it like customers do. So you should be testing all this stuff. You should be calling the phone line, ordering stuff, sending it back, uh, calling the phone numbers on the website, breaking things, being difficult. You know, try and, uh, and actually destroy your service. But the interesting thing here is that you, you should be trying to wear the magical slippers of their customer experience because if you don't look at it at all, then it won't take you to those wonderful places where they give you insight. Um, there is one little caveat to this, though. Some guys in America were running this twenty uh, They paid these guys $20 an hour to do tasks for you, one of these task services. So you can get them to run to the shops for you or get a pair of shoes from a store. And the thing was, is they thought, well, we'll go and do this kind of stuff ourselves, so we'll get to see what it's like. And they went out and they said, oh, it was great. You know, the people were really happy with us. So what you do is you're sending really highly paid people from your office out to do the same job that someone gets paid $20 an hour. Of course they were fucking happy. They did a really great job. But the $20 an hour guys weren't doing such a good job. So they had convinced themselves that there was nothing wrong with their service. So there are downsides to eating your own dog food. This is a really important one. It's kind of crossing that uh, boundary of quantitative and qualitative. Um, this is one of my secret things that I use to get real insight on. The uh, example from earlier on with that long form, right? I can see that in session replay. Someone comes to the form, they scroll down, they scroll up, they scroll down, and then they piss off. Right? And it's like, I've looked at it, it's really fucking long, it's like an Andrex toilet roll, it's not a form, I'm gone, right? And when they, if they're evaluating the amount of work to get to the next step, so the chunking in that just looks overwhelming, it's like, no way am I filling that out. So it really puts people off. Um, so it's a really interesting way of getting visitor recordings of people. So I uh, will get a couple of hundred recordings of people's mouse movements and where they click and how they fill out the form. But I then speed them up five or ten times. So it's like this, people filling out the form. Like, because a lot of them are much slower than I fill out forms, so speeding them up gets them to almost normal speed. But I can get through two or three hundred recordings in an afternoon of one page. So if I'm then doing work on that page, optimizing it, or I'm going to do some user testing, I actually have some, a little bit of insight into where people are getting stuck, what fields they're having real problems with, and also what kind of scrolling and other interactions they're having. It's not about page views anymore. Analytics where you go page A, page B, page C, it's not like that anymore. People go to the page, they play with the images, they check the sizes, they add it to their basket, they, put, they click the wish list. There are all these interactions happening on the page. So it's not page A, B, C, it's interaction one, two, three, four, and then the next page. And it's a really important distinction. So session replay helps you dig into some of that stuff. Two really good tools keep cropping up. Session cam, very, very good. Have it on your site, see recordings in 10 minutes. It's really that good. Check it out. Um, voice of customer. This is going to be mentioned today, but it's basically having site-wide omnipresent feedback or triggered behavioral feedback. Like, hey, oh, you're just leaving. Can I just ask you a question? Um, it's like when someone leaves your store, you know, did, could you not find what you're looking for, sir? Can you tell me what you're after? Maybe I can help. You know, asking people really does work. And this tool from 4Q has a thing called the task gap analysis. It says, what was the primary purpose of your visit today? Yeah, it was that. Did you get the primary purpose of your visit done? No, I didn't. And if the answer was no, why not? And if the answer was yes, what did you find good about it? It's four questions. That's all you're asking. I'm giving you a rating. But what they're telling you is, what are all the things that I wanted to do that I couldn't do because your site has such shit UX? That's essentially what a task gap analysis is. So it's, it's um, really, really good. Qualaroo is one that a lot of people have been using, formerly Kiss Insights, but it seems to be really expensive. A lot of people are giving me tips saying, Feedback Daddy is a really cheap, better model check it out. Um, 
And really on the whole, uh, getting their voice to customer, you know, make this stuff really easy. Add contacts and feedback to all your mails. If you're, if you're interested in getting good feedback uh, and running good surveys, read Caroline Jarrett's stuff. She's really smart. She knows how to put a survey together. And, you know, try and run regular NPS and behaviorally triggered surveys. So when I say behaviorally triggered, it's when somebody, uh, somebody does or doesn't do something. So they leave a process. So at Love Film, we used to ask, you know, why didn't you complete your process? And we found out it was because we weren't offering the payment options that our customers had. And that's why we implemented PayPal so we got more money. But getting ratings on service metrics, so the numbers behind what makes up the NPS score, is really important. And that will tell you what things, out of all the things you're doing, are actually driving the big levels of delight in your product. Um, and one last tip. Make teams of people spend time at the call center. Make them listen to calls or sit with people who are answering calls or doing chat. And make them spend a long time there because it gets them connected with the kind of problems that the call center is having and the kind of things they're fielding for customers. One excellent way of doing this is to take them out and get them drunk and get them to bitch about it. So if you take a whole load of people from call center out of the office and, and ask them what's wrong with the product after a few drinks, they will actually tell you the truth. They won't tell you the truth in front of their boss in the office or they will quote meaningless KPI statistics to you, but this is the best way to do it, drunken bitching. Another problem could be your inputs are all wrong. If you're, if you've got uh, ego, opinion, panic, cherished notions, whims, something you saw in a magazine, something your competitor did, knee-jerk reactions, dice rolling, any of these, that's great. This is what fills most people's product vacuums. But these are the kind of inputs that you're looking for. Uh, and, you know, I've got a range of quant and qual stuff on here. But if you're getting a good hit rate on this kind of stuff, then you're getting a more complete picture. And that's the thing that quant and qual does together. It helps you triangulate problems and see them from two different sets of data or insight. And that's much better than only having one dimension of data to look at. Another one, act like a private eye. You know, be a sleuth here and... and um, uh, I used to, I put a broken web server up so anyone ever coming from Sainsbury's or Tesco's uh, corporate offices and from Accenture who were doing all the work for Sainsbury's, we would send them to a broken web server and it totally fooled them for about seven months. They thought our website was shit and really broken, but they were just lazy ass guys who never did any work from home like us saddos. So they never actually got to see the site the way it really was, and they thought I was evil for doing that. It was very funny. Um, but for your brands, sub-brands, competitors, check review sites, discussion boards, use Google Alerts, see what they're using. Ghostery.com will tell you all the tags. You can find out what A-B testing they're running and cool things like that. You can find out a lot of what they're up to. Sign up for their emails. Amazing. Really simple. Oh, hey, they're having a 50% sale next week. Maybe we shouldn't do ours at the same time. No S, Sherlock. And run cross-competitor surveys. It was vital for Love Film to probe the weak areas of our competitors and their service metrics so that we could outspend them on the ones that we knew would allow us to beat them. It's a little bit more complicated than that sounds, but this was pretty vital for us growing. And if you're really interested in the whole uh, raft of social and competitor monitoring tools, you'll find them on that slide deck. And this whole deck and all the links will be available for download. If you're not doing browser testing or testing for email rendering, so you send an email out, did people read it? Did it render on their device? No fucking idea. <laughs> the developer said it did, but did you prove it? Litmus will tell you a lot about how your emails render on people's devices. Very, very important. But also browser testing. Every single site I have worked on in the past year and a half has had one or more browser bugs that cost anywhere from a few hundred quid up to eight million pounds a year, right? And everyone says, oh, but they would call us up and tell us if it was broken. No, they fucking won't. It's not going to happen. Right, it's like, I, I've just got a small rendering problem in Firefox 26 I thought I'd bring to your attention. <laughs> Scenes that do not happen in real life. So test it, because you'll make money from this. And it's also a really good way of getting low-hanging fruit shown to a client, because you're saying, look, this is broken. It's costing you money. 
but they never knew it was there. It's like having a fire in John Lewis. How would you not notice there's a fire in the middle of the sales floor? But you can easily have a milli an eight million quid hole in your website and nobody notices. Anyway, crazy stuff. <laughs> if you want to test on mobile devices, take my advice, use real mobile devices, not emulators. These are the two to look at. AppThwack is really cheap. Device Anywhere is the one that I use all the time. It means that I can rent a phone in the USA and install apps on it and go to the US App Store. I can rent a phone anywhere around the world, any model, any type, and I can actually grab control of it uh, remotely and run with it. Um, A-B testing tools. You should be looking at some of these. Optimizely is the one I almost exclusively use now. Uh, Google Content Experiments will also do some good stuff for you. But the future of all this testing is in these three links here. There's this thing called multi-armed bandit. Imagine a split test that shifts the proportion of people it shows the A and the B to depending on how it knows the pattern of traffic is changing. So if it knows more teenage girls come in on Saturday morning, then it will show them more a picture of the fluffy kitten because it knows from last week that that really worked with those people that came in. So it's a machine learning tool that will actually adapt the creative that it shows. So it's kind of like personalization and split testing combined. Now this tool from Conductrix, which we'll be playing with really soon, will actually start to tell me what the patterns are rather than me going looking for them. And that is going to completely change the game for A-B testing. This took a long time to find this photo. Right! It's a picture of two slugs fighting. Okay? This could be your website performance, particularly on mobile. Three things to add to your list. These are the only tools to look at. Google page speed tools, search for that on Google, you'll get it all. Web page test for desktop site and Mobi test for mobile devices. This is a really cool feature of webpagetest.org and impresses the hell out of clients. It shows you a film strip time lapse view of how your web page builds over a timeline. And you can take yours and your competitor side by side and where yours is blank for 15 seconds and theirs is rendered in four seconds it has a powerful visual impact on senior management, this sort of stuff. It really does. Better than me talking about the performance issues or metrics, just show them how much they suck compared to competitors. And if you use MobyTest, it'll tell you things like these. Look at that size of the Daily Mail website, four and a half megabytes on mobile. That's what that picture is there. It's like stuffing a pig down a toilet using a twiglet, right? And they expect this... They expect this to be, you know, usable on a mobile device, right? If you're sitting on O2, if any of you here on O2 with an iPhone, you know what I mean. You can be on a train, central London, it doesn't really matter. Your data service is shit. It's really bad. So, um, but the interesting thing here is this right hand side, it's about your round trip. So, the BBC not doing as well as they probably should there, but look at Tesco and IKEA. They're only making 14 requests to build that whole page, and that's as important as the size of the page itself. But you can work this stuff out. The tools are there. They're free. This is a graph to show your e-commerce director why performance is important. If you want stuff that will convince senior management to invest in this, show them this slide deck. It will scare the crap out of them. Because it shows that if you artificially slow a website down, it shows you exactly how much money you use. And you can use this to show potential money you'll get from improving yours if it really sucks. And it's really solid data. All the slides are here on this deck. Please use it to get your own way. And this is the difference. The people in the blue line, that was their return rate to an e-commerce site when, when they were slowed down. And look, they still think it sucks even after we took off the performance slowdown. But the difference between that pink line and that blue line is potentially commercial suicide. You know, if people aren't coming back because it was really slow the last time, then the difference between a fast site and a slow site is a massive amount of money, that gap between the two. Another final one, um, or nearly final one, is uh, you don't know it, but your analytics tool is broken and it is reporting bad data. You just don't know where it is. I could confidently predict I could find broken stuff in all your analytics setups. This would be like having a till that never added up the money that was put in the till every day. And you, you'd either convince yourself as a shopkeeper that someone was stealing from you or the till was broken, right? But we're running around doing web analytics when it's like that, and that's not good. 
So would you drive around your car if the fuel gauge moved around randomly? You know, it'd be a bit like gamification of whether you would run out of petrol. <laughs> Fun, edgy, but not really what you want to be doing every week. And, you know, if you are, it, it, some people are spending as much as, uh, you know, maintaining a small jet fighter plane on their e-commerce platform and all the people that they hire and everything else yet they'll kind of put Lego instrumentation and investment into their analytics. And if you did that with a plane like this, you would get shot down or you would crash. Easy. So talk to me about an analytics health check. Put some investment into it. And don't just accept bad data. Change I don't know or we don't have that to I will find out. And if you are using Google Analytics, look at your event tracking because that will tell you about people's interaction stream with a product, not which pages they visit. So you wouldn't use a bit of scrap of paper in John Lewis to add up your sales during the day. So wouldn't do it in retail, please stop doing it online. And you know, if you're gonna win races in F1, then if you don't have the right performance data, you will be beaten by the other guys really easily. And it's getting that way in online commerce. It's marginal gains, so the people that win will be the smarter ones. Going agile, um, and an interesting point here, just to recap, um, I, I've kind of looked at all these new things that have come along, and they are new things, but they're not really new. It's like Lean UX, no, I've kind of seen that before. It wasn't called Lean UX, but now it's all hip and trendy, and people are talking about all these new names for things, but I just kind of wanted to show that the stuff I'm doing is actually the kind of stuff that other people call user-centered design. So if you look at Lean UX, it's got these kind of positive benefits, but it's got a downside. Some people think that doing Lean UX with your work colleagues and no input from customers, it's kind of like selfie Lean UX, where there's no data or any input. I think that's really great, right? That is just, that is just air guitar. Please don't do it. The other problem is, is when you try to do this stuff and say, what's the product going to look like? Oh, we've no idea. It's Lean UX. We'll figure it out. It will be whatever whatever it works out optimally to be. And we say, and we're spending how much on this thing that we don't know what it is yet? Really hard to sell. And then this stuff, which I've been doing back since the John Lewis days, you know, Agile, UX, UCD, Collaborative Design, various names for it. And it's very good, but sometimes people don't have quantitative data in the mix here. So you, uh, the, there's a company here today that once built a website for me and we spent you know, a huge amount of money, uh, over a hundred grand on user testing, and it didn't make any more money when we be tested it. And the reason was, is we'd made some things better and some things worse, and they cancelled out. So the performance of the new product was flat. The analytics data told us what we'd screwed up, and we fixed it and made it 20% improvement rather than flat. But doing this without the numbers in the mix is the problem. And then I kind of looked at this and I thought, yeah, I do a bit of trad UX, I do a bit of agile with the team. And yeah, we do lean in terms of split testing, hypothesis, and, and build, measure, learn test loops. But really that for me is conversion rate optimization, kind of sitting in the middle of all of that. You know, and maybe I need a better word for it. So I thought, I'll make up one, lean optimization, right? <laughs> now claimed that and I'll buy the domain name tonight, you know? Um, but it's, it's a blend of user experience design, agile PM, the kind of rapid lean UX build measure learn site, uh, cycles, then this data triangulation using more than one source to frame a problem, and then some triage and prioritization. You know, where are you bleeding most money on your site? Fix those things first, and then prioritize the work that you're doing. And this works really well. You know, you need a pretty strong PM to run it. It can be a bit batshit insane, but it's probably the best way that I've ever built products. It's just gluing other stuff together. So call it whatever you like. And that's pretty much how I work it um, in terms of conversion optimization. And this integrates with the UX work I'm doing. So this diagram is a lot more complicated uh, in reality, but that should give you some idea of how it works. But essentially, every single thing that we do on these sites, we're building a new product, we're adding a new widget, we're going to take a thing away, we're going to change the page design. It all comes back to this. And I have this up on the wall, and I say to people, if your problem does not fit into this sentence, then please fuck off and move away from my desk, right? Because we're not going to do it. So people might say, ah, uh, so what else? We believe that by adding funky orange buttons for everybody on the homepage, things will be cool. 
OK, that's not going to work. We're not doing that. So if you can't fit the thing you're working on, the widget, the new design, into this kind of hypothesis, then you've got a problem. You also need to be able to reverse it. What happens if you're wrong and you make it worse on the site? How can you prove it unless you're able to get the data that shows you you were wrong? If all the data you've got is only the positive stuff, you are suffering from a shocking case of confirmation bias. It just looks good because there's no evidence to the contrary. So this is a great way of saying, please fit your problem in there, otherwise we are not running a split test on it and we're not going to try it inside and measure it. So a summary here, agile with a small a. Design your own methodology is about how you experiment and optimize with your team, not anyone else's. So don't be a slave here. The methodology is the slave, not the master of the situation. Uh, and there's a really great study Harvard did into collaborative working of teams. You know, it's all about, it's an all-time thing. It isn't about methodologies. It's about the style and mindset of the managers and the team members themselves. Big topic. Ask me later if you have any questions. Finally, some little counterintuitive <laughs> weird examples that can show how this stuff glues together. See this, mentioning spam, you think, oh, we'll put a message on here saying we won't send you any spam, but you just said, hey, there's spam on the internet, everybody run, right? So that got nearly 20% less sign-ups by adding that text. When we split tested that by adding a slightly different wording, we've changed a 20% loss into a 20% gain. That's a huge swing. And we just changed a little tiny piece of copy text on there. So that's a really good example. You can get big shifts and small changes here. So you can do little micro tests like this. And we did a lot of image testing at Autoglass. Over 20 million of them. So I can tell you things like if you fold your arms in photos like this, or you have arms on hips, or if you have arms behind you, if you're not looking at someone, if you're not meeting eye gaze with them, so you're looking off, that doesn't work. Pointing doesn't work arms to the side folded like that, all, all these different body poses and body language actually have a huge effect on how the photo is perceived. And also people don't know what to do with their hands and photos, they're like doing strange things like this. Uh, and so you have to give them something to put into their hands, right? You have to give them a prop and we tried cloths and, uh, and tools and all sorts of things like that. And the best thing turned out to be a clipboard, because the clipboard was like, I'm ready to write some stuff down and sort this out for you. And interestingly enough, whenever we tested a strong female and a male image in the same market, the female always won. And for a company that thought, you know, somebody once said to me, if we put women on the website, it will put guys off from buying the service. How fucking wrong they were. That was so good to prove that wrong. And an interesting question about this test. So here's an interesting one. Who can tell me? Imagine this is in German and this is in Australia, right? In Australia, we get 6% lift. All we changed was the photo for a control one, right? And assume it's the same. So this lady gets a huge lift, right? And there's no difference in what we're doing here. And she gets a small lift. Can anyone tell me why? What's wrong with this lady? It's not wrong with that lady. Okay, that's one thing. <laughs> Anything else? The brand. It's only a stock photo. It's a stock photo, correct. The other thing is she's not smiling properly with her cheekbones and her eye crinkle. There's no eye crinkle and cheekbones there. People can tell the difference. I've split tested actors with and without cheekbone and eye crinkle. And people can tell you it's there, but they will convert more if they're smiling genuinely or they're attempting to smile genuinely. So, if you want to see crack stock photography, hit sethotties.com. That should trigger the porn filter at your work and set the alarms going. Um, this is a great test, the BBC fake smile test. See how good you are at actually testing, uh, guessing whether someone's faking it in the smiles. Um, there's loads of other things there. This is a young lady called Izzy, who we put up against the incumbent Gavin, who is a homo... <laughs> Homophobic twat, by the way. But anyway, that's, uh, I digress. And people, people said, people said, so we tested him. So he's in the TV advert, right? And so we tested him uh, on the site with the TV off air and the TV on air. And yeah, it was good. You know, we got a better reaction with the TV. That's what you'd think. We used the same guy that was on the TV advert. 
there'd be bigger uplift, right? Um, but they thought, well, that won't happen with the woman, will it, right? Because she's not the guy in the TV ad. But look what happened here. And she actually slayed him. So even though he was running in the TV ad, she performed better because more women, when they came to the site, converted, right? And that was the interesting thing for us. So she then started the TV slot, but the side benefit of this was that was fantastically successful, but we also hired hundreds of female technicians who then wanted to come and join Autoglass. So unintended consequence, but that was a good outcome. And I had a guy in Spain once said to me, I'm not using this lady on the website site. She is <laughs> ugly. She is ugly. That's why he said to me, ugly. So we tested it against like beefy Nadal types, you know, carrying tars around like this, you know, and rivulets of sweat, like really pretty good looking kind of um, ripped guys, right? And everyone thought that she, that she was going to get beaten, but she beat all of them, right? And the, the issue here is that the type of service are run, it's about that emotional connection. So it's not about what you think when you look at the image or what your colleague thinks, it's about what the people to the website think. When we unpacked this with a few people, it was like they said, oh, she's going to let my mum, she looks like she's going to sort it all out, make me a cup of tea, <laughs> tell me what needs to be done. She'll phone the insurance company and go, there, there, then. <laughs> so it's kind of that emotional connection's coming to them, but clearly, you know, she's not somebody an art director would have picked. But I don't care. I go with her any day because she's doing the right thing for the message. So... Two small examples before I, I wrap up. The Bell, Bell Run has a huge NPS program around the world. We, when I was working there, we interviewed millions of people every year about their experience of the service and the service metrics. But we also glued that together with the web data. Interestingly enough, that survey that goes out as an online survey gets a 35% take-up rate and only a 6% drop rate across the entire survey. If you want to know how to get those kind of um, completion rates, 94% is good. In a form, then there are only three people to read. Luke Robluski, um, Caroline Jarrett, and talk to sticky content. So it was copy and forms optimization. That's how we got it. Um, in Western European markets, Autoglass, Carglass, and the other brands, we actually have a higher NPS score than Apple does. Wait a minute, a consumer product that's sexy, that you go and pay a lot of money for and you think is really cool, gets a lower NPS rating than a smashed windscreen service, which is a distressed purchase. So how could we get, in some of those markets, a higher NPS score than Apple? Really by measuring all these drivers of delight. And on AB tests, we could split the NPS data. So when we put a new funnel in, we could actually see how much the funnel was making the NPS score higher at the end. So we took two Bunches of people, old funnel, new funnel. Everybody got exactly the same windscreen repair service uh, a week or two later. And then a week or two after that, they answered the survey, but they rated the new, the new funnel, the experience that had the new funnel bit in it, even though it was a couple of weeks ago, they still rated the whole experience 5.5% better. And that taught me that there's a huge residual effect in feeling and interpretation of your brand and service that comes from just that web touch point and it lasts the whole way through. And um, so if you're not measuring that kind of thing, then you might be looking at the money in your A-B test, but you might be missing out the qualitative side of the data. And this is where Love Film beat a lot of their competitors. We used regression to find where can we invest a pound of money that will make our NPS score go up higher. Where would a pound get the biggest bang for buck return? If we were going to improve a service metric, which one would it be? And that allowed us to work out competitor weaknesses and then build positions that they then couldn't knock us out of. So analytic split testing and UX definitely helped them get to be where they are today, which is part of Amazon now and their website is gone. <laughs> Um, so how's all this stuff been working out for me? Well, all these methodologies and cute diagrams are not actually real life, and it's about the mindset of the team and managers. Not all my clients have these working bits, nor do they choose to buy all these tools. But using some or any technique instead of fucking guessing or, or uh, you know, going by ego, opinion, or cherished notion inside your, your organization, and really bringing all this stuff together and blending it together 
Um, it's been my biggest insight out of all the things I've tried and all the stuff I've done and all the methodologies I've played with. Blending lean and agile UX with conversion optimization techniques is the thing that's driven the, 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 most, the best product improvement in the shortest space of time for me with the least hassle. So uh, UX got hitched to numbers, they ran away and lived happily ever after, at least in my universe, and I hope it becomes so in yours. One final thought. If it isn't working, you're not fucking doing it right. So keep practicing. The tools are there, the techniques are there, the people you can talk to, so there's no excuse. Go out and get some of this. And thank you very much for your time today.